On October 13, 1902, Teddy Roosevelt called for a meeting at the temporary White House at 22 Lafayette Place in Washington, D.C., which had major implications on the American economy. The Great Coal Strike of 1902 was five months old, and the president feared a coal famine which he stated came with certainty of riots which might develop into social war. As this potential war was being shut down, another one begun on the same date. And it all revolved around the gridiron. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step off the DeLorean, the date is October 13th, 1902, and we're in Rock Island, Illinois. We're here to talk about the beginning of a new war. But this war was not the same that Teddy Roosevelt dealt with at the doors of his footsteps, the temporary White House, 22 Lafayette Place, Washington, D.C. No, this was not for a call, a meeting to ultimately lead to the ending of a coal strike. It was the beginning of something else. And according to RockIslandIndependence.com, this was the first time the team was ever mentioned in the Rock Island Argus. This was the local newspaper for Rock Island, Illinois. And the team would play a major role in the formation of the NFL and would ultimately become one of the original 14 teams in that inaugural season. And according to the Rock Island Argus, the Independents defeated the standards of Davenport by a score of six to nothing. I mean, the standards of Davenport. I mean, they're the Davenport standards. I don't even know why they're called the Davenport standards, but the way that they would express various sayings back then was different than it is today. That'd be like saying the Lions of Detroit or the Packers of Green Bay or any of those other kinds of things. But back in the day, it was different. You see, this professional, well, really wasn't a professional team necessarily because sometimes it wasn't. They were really just neighborhood teams or even athletic clubs or other types of social clubs. I mean, back in 1902, we're talking just 10 years after the first professional football player was ever documented. So it's not like it was anywhere of which today. And the website also stated that the Rock Island team didn't have any affiliation with any specific clubs. That's why they were called the Independents. I mean, great Scott, that makes sense, right? They're the independent team, so we'll call them the Rock Island Independents. And then they roamed around a few years here and there, playing a couple of games here, a couple of games there. But in 1907, this was considered their first official full season. And for a few years, things just happen where, again, it's like they play some seasons, not a whole lot going on. It was not super organized. 1912, we're getting a little bit more organized, and by all indications, they were pretty darn good because under Jack Roche, they were undefeated. 8-0, and zero, capturing the Illinois state title. In this season, I found that they outscored their opponents 212-0. to zero. I mean, that's not too shabby. That comes from the Pro Football Researchers Association website. Then in 1916, Jack Roche and Walter Flanagan both formed Rock Island Independent Teams. I'm like, what? They got two different teams of the same? would be like, all right, well, I don't like you, and I'm going to form my own team, so bring everybody over here. Oh, wait a second. That has happened. The AFL, the NFL, many other times throughout history when other leagues have formed. But this was just teams within the same city forming. But it wasn't the structure like it is today. So you had Walter Flanagan and Jack Roche. They would have two different teams say, hey, my guys are playing with me. Your guys play with you. We'll see who wins out at the end of the year. Well, Flanagan won out because the majority of Jack Roche's players are like, screw this. We're out of here. He couldn't even supposedly get a second game for them to play. But then, unfortunately, the Great War came upon us. America declares war on Germany, April 6th, 1917. The war, at least America's perspective, will go from 1917 there, April 6th, and then it would end November 11th, 1918. And just like the World War II episodes we talk about, the Great War surely did pay a toll on professional football. Of course, it was more important, the entire American society and everything else, but professional football 
was at the crossroads. I mean, later in 1917, this is before the war ended, it was a big moment for the independents. Flanagan, the coach, you know, basically the manager, he wanted to get the team more national recognition. So on November 4th, 1917, he invited the Minneapolis Marines, which were known as the Northwest Professional Champs, to Douglas Park, the home of the Rock Island Independents. And I got some of this information from an article that Bob Brunwer and Bob Carroll from the Coffin Corner over at Pro Football Researchers Association kind of put out back in 1983. This is a cool magazine that still goes on today. So if you want to get a uh, more involved with research and learning about the history of the game, I suggest that you go check it out, Pro Football Researchers Association. They'll give you a cool magazine and everything, and that they're not endorsed. I don't really have any affiliation with them, but I do a lot of research for these guys. And in this article, it stated that 6,425 fans showed up to watch the game, the biggest crowd to date for the Rock Island Independents. They lost 7-3, to but they kept the game close. And this was against, like I said, the Northwest Professional Champs. So this was getting to be more big time. Not just little tiny Rock Island, Illinois. But then due to the war, 1918 would be challenging. You've got to figure. Men going off to fight. You don't have as many of the players to choose from. Organization, resource distribution is just shut down. And quite frankly, football is not that big of a deal. It wasn't like in World War II where it was getting more popular professional football and it was able to help Americans get through the war and just kind of get their minds off things. It was still popular enough, but it was nowhere where it would be 1942, 1946, and then carrying on to nowadays. But then in 1919, they get back on track. War is over. Don't get to deal with that anymore. We're starting to get closer to the Roaring Twenties. So Flanagan he decided he would make some moves. He invited the quarterback from the Minneapolis Marines, Rube Ursula, to come to Rock Island, and he ended up signing him as the coach along with Ursula would also come many players from Minneapolis. You see, they had, of course, some star players, and if they're going to lose their quarterback and their main dude, well, let's go play with that guy down in Rock Island. And the Coffin Corner mentioned that the team was growing in popularity because the fame had gotten to a point where every year they would have new players, young blood, coming up and showing up for the first practice. And the article that stated how Flanagan kind of picked his players, it stated that he developed a surefire way to weed out the chaff. For the first couple of days, he held foot races and wrestling matches until all the pretenders had wilted and only the real Ironmen remained. Then they started learning plays. I mean, imagine today, you've got all these players holding out for tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, and then they're told you got to race each other and you got to wrestle around the dirt and that's how we're going to figure out who's going to be on this team. I'm just telling you, different times, a different generation, different expectations. But still, the team was gaining national steam. In 1919, they would play some of the Ohio and Indiana teams, which were considered the better leagues. And they did handle their own. And this is the first time when I saw that the Hammond pros, the Hammond professionals, were referred to as the Hammond $20,000. As in, basically, they paid $20,000 just to put together a squad. Nowadays, it doesn't seem like that much money. But back then, professional football, that's a lot of money. They put together $20,000 worth to get these professionals together and have this group of all-stars. And there's a cool photo from an old-time promotion for a game between the Columbus Panhandles and the Rock Island Independents from November 23rd of that year. And I'll leave it in the show notes for you. And by the way, you can get to the show notes through your podcast player choice or by heading to thefootballhistorydude.com. Again, that's thefootballhistorydude.com. Also, while you're at it, I ask that you subscribe for free to this show by mashing that little subscribe button on your podcast player choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest off the press episodes well each and every week. But let's go back to that promotion piece. We're talking about different times. Again, different ways to communicate how things are going to happen. Now we have the internet. We've got phones in our pockets alerting us to when the games are going to happen. We've got the scoreboards instantly at our pockets. But it wasn't the same back in 1919. We're talking about a time when they had to publish newspaper articles and then they'd have graphics and everything like that in the article as promotion where everybody would read these newspapers and that's how they were going to get their news. That's how they were going to know what was coming up, or these flyers floating around town. And this particular flyer, the one that I'm going to leave in the show notes for you, 
It was pretty neat. I mean, it was just, it, to me, it was cool. And here's how it read. It went as such. Tomorrow, November 23rd, game called at 2.30 p.m. This is the first game of the season that we have entered with odds against us. The Independents realize it's the hardest game and will put a battle up for their lives to defeat the Panhandles. Manager Carr of the Panhandles has predicted that his club will win by at least one touchdown. The Independents are just as confident of winning by the same margin. See this game. It will be the best football ever seen in this locality. I mean, it's just a, just different today. It's not the same where it was like, I mean, we have all this hoopla and hype around everything, commercials and promos and everything still like they did back then, but it was just different. You're reading this. It was pretty cool. Just different stories about why you should come see this game. Convincing them. Nowadays, it's like, well, we'll post when the game's going to be played. All these fans watching fantasy football and they're just going to show up. Not taking away because that's how the NFL got to where it is. They built the story. The story of the men, the giants of the gridiron, and how they would go to war with each other. And that's why people love this game so much. But back then, the admission for this game was only $1.10 plus war tax. And for the hometown independence, it could not have went better. They defeated the panhandles 40 to nothing. The vaunted Columbus panhandles. My guess, it wasn't as close as everybody thought it might be. But they did this in front of 8,000 fans. So I think winning this game and then rolling out more victories after that just continued to make Flanagan think. We do not want to stick around just this little mediocrity, this locality. We want to challenge the big dogs for the right to be called national champion. Well, at the time, the big dogs were, well, not a pun intended, but the Canton Bulldogs. Flanagan would challenge the Bulldogs to a game to settle the national championship. Like, come on, man, I am throwing you a bluff. A uh, triple dog dare you. Again, not a pun intended. But let's do this thing. And supposedly Flanagan opened his big old mouth and he guaranteed a $5,000 offer for the gate receipts. As in, that's a minimum. Now that might not mean anything to you. But what that meant back then was a big deal. Because the visiting team would also share the gate receipts for the game. And that's where they got all their money. The revenue came from the gate receipts, the tickets. It wasn't from TV contracts or merchandise. It was some things going on with, let's charge a bunch of money for these hot dogs and pops and beers and such. But it was mostly the gate receipts. So offering a guarantee of $5,000 at the time was a big deal. But the Coffin Corner mentioned how the Bulldogs initially were interested, of course, this $5,000 guaranteed purse. But then Jim Thorpe, the star player and coach, called off the game. <laughs> the funny thing was he had to, it said he called off the game. He wired it in to call it off. We're talking like, dee -dee 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 -dee. just not the same as it is today. The game was canceled in his eyes. The reason he gave was because they had already disbanded. The team wasn't around anymore. But the article said it was a poor excuse because most of the players didn't even live in Canton anyways. Also mentioned that Thorpe was the wiser because he heard that when the Akron pros went to Douglas Park there in Rock Island, only 1,700 fans showed up. So he's like, if only 1,700 fans are going to show up, you're charging a buck ten or whatever it is. How are you going to give me $5,000? That's supposed to be, uh, you know, half, doubled. Well, 10,000 fans, that's not even coming close is what he's thinking in his mind. But the Rock Island Independents, their viewpoint, well, the Canton Bulldogs, they chickened out. They're a bunch of scaredy cats. Again, not the big bulldogs that they claim to be. So the Rock Island Independents, Flanagan, they would claim the title of American professional football champs for themselves. But nevertheless, the successful year that it was for the small town football team, professional football team, helped earn them the national respect. So much as they were invited to a special place on September 17th, 1920. Yes, Flanagan would represent the Rock Island Independents at the foundation, the birth of the National Football League. Again, at the time called the American Professional Football Association. However, they would be one of the original 14 members of the National Football League. So I'd say, tiny little town, a little football club starting in the neighborhood, getting all the way up 
to becoming one of the first ever National Football League teams in such a short period of time is not a small feat. This is a tall order that they're going to have to deal with, though, because now you're in the big leagues, boys. You're playing against the top teams, the top professional football teams out there. So just a short nine days later, the date would be September 26, 1920, and we are in Rock Island, Illinois at Douglas Park. This was the first game that would feature an APFA team. Remember, the American Professional Football Association, later to be named the National Football League. This wasn't the official first game between two NFL teams, though. They happened to play a team outside of the American Professional Football Association. They played the St. Paul Ideals. Then their first official NFL game between two teams would be the Muncie Flyers, and they would beat them 45 to nothing. Which brings us to another interesting point. You see, according to a recent NFL press release, the Rock Island Independents have the highest point differential to start a season through three games in NFL history. We're talking about the entire 100 seasons of the NFL. They outscored their opponents for the first three games, 119 to zero. Now, this is back in 1920, so it was a little bit different as far as the competition and how greatly balanced they were, or rather the imbalance of competition. But still, 1920, the first season of the NFL, the inaugural season, and the record has stood all throughout the test of time. But at the time of this recording, the New England Patriots have not played their third game of this 100th season of the NFL. With a current point differential of 76-3, to they only need to win. And this is against the Jets, the lowly Jets who have a third-string quarterback playing. They only have to beat them by 24 points to break the record. So maybe we should take that DeLorean back to the future and snag that gray sports almanac to lay down some cheddar to see what's going to happen. But I'm not going to make predictions. Because that's not the business that we're in. The Gray Sports Almanac, that reference for you, I wonder if you understand that. Go ahead and take that to the bank. But I will. I'll predict. The Patriots are going to stompede all over the Jets because Bilicek will not lay down. They will end up crushing them by probably more than 50 points. But let's go ahead and move on. Because we're talking about the Rock Island Independence. Their fourth game of the inaugural season after this 119-0 was their first meeting with the Decatur Staleys, later to be tamed. Tamed. <laughs> they weren't, I guess they didn't tame them too well, but they were the Chicago Bears. They lost 7 to nothing, so it wasn't really that big of a loss. But during this time in the game, they had players that were knocked out by Staley center George Trafton. Then they would have a rematch that year. The game ends in a 0-0 tie. I mean, talk about a crappy f- fantasy football days nowadays. That would not be cool, unless you're the defense holder. But that was not the story that stole the headlines. We talked about this in a previous episode where Trafton again knocked out players out of the game. And in this, the Rock Island Argus stated, Fred Chicken with the broken leg and center Hal Grunderson was nearly killed when Trafton slid across his face. The title of that article was Staley's Win World's Dirt Title. And after the game, George Hallis, he would hand that bag, that sack of money to Trafton, the Staley's share of the gate receipts that is and more than 100 angry Rock Island fans would start chasing this dude down. Later, Hallis would explain why he gave the money to Trafton. He said, I knew I'd be running for the money, but George was running for his life. Let's shift forward, 1921, just a year. From Cliff Crystal, the team historian for the Green Bay Packers, in an article on the Packers website, talking about that first season for the Packers. They said that the Packers, four of them were from the Rock Island Independence. The 1922 Four more joined from the Independents. Co-founder George Whitney Calhoun was jealous of the Rock Island Independents, I said, and there's an article also that was written from the Green Bay Press Gazette that went as such. Rock Island is the best supported professional football team in the Middle West. At least that is what manager Flanagan claims and he has the evidence to back up his statement. The Rock Island merchants consider the team as an asset to the city and every fall they cut loose the purse strings to tell Flanagan to spare no expense on to put a winner on the field. The Islanders have their own practice field. They are housed in a two-family apartment and their own chef prepares all the meals for the pigskin stars. I mean, <laughs> this isn't a team that exists any longer. But we are talking about a far cry 
from today's professional football. I mean, they stated how it was, they had their own practice field. I'm like, what? Their own practice field? That's a big deal to you? Not the case today. Crystal also stated that the Rock Island paper probably covered professional football at the beginning better than any team's town. It was called, again, the Rock Island Argus. The Argus took credit for the first paper in country to hold. A, they hooked up a special wire at the site of out-of-town games. And then they would have a transmitted play-by-play and someone on the other end would announce what was going on. Mind you, this is before radio broadcasts. The first national radio broadcast of the NFL game, we talked about this in a Thanksgiving episode, did not happen until 1934. The Thanksgiving game between the Bears and the Lions, where rookie Beatty Feathers was in the season where he would reach the first 1,000-yard mark for running back ever in the NFL. It didn't hurt that the Lions owner was uh, involved in radio himself. But something impressive, now we think this would be crazy. In that same article from Crystal, on the Packers website, it explained how 4,000 fans jam-packed 2nd Avenue in Rock Island just to hear the results from the game between the Chicago Staley's and the Rock Island Independence at Cubs Park on November 13th, 1921. Later, of course, they were called the Bears, not the Staley's. So there's like bears all over the place, always in the history at the beginning of the NFL. Overall, the team would leave the NFL in 1926 to become a charter member of the first American Football League rendition. This was that one that Red Grange and C.C. Pyle put together, and it only lasted for a year. It would fold. And then, so gone would be the Rock Island Independents. And although the Rock Island Independents were only in the NFL for about a half decade, the mark the team left on the league as a charter member cannot go unnoticed. Because there are four members of the Professional Football Hall of Fame that played at least a portion of their careers with the Rock Island Independents. They were Ed Healy, Jim Councilman, Joe Guyon, and the great one, Jim Thorpe. And the cool thing is that the NFL's page dedicated to the original teams states how even though professional football has not been in the city for over 90 years, the city still celebrates its football history each year with a vintage American football game. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Football History Dude and were able to gain some gridiron knowledge nuggets about one of the charter teams of the NFL. If you like the show, I ask that you please share it with at least one family member or friend and get them to check out thefootballhistorydude.com. Now next week, we're going to take a look at another charter team of the NFL. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe with your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads.